Let's talk about public benefits and tax returns because they sort of go hand in hand. First is the big question. Do immigrants use public benefits at a rate equal to native born Americans or at a higher rate? Some statistics will tell you that immigrants use public benefits at a rate of about 30% of the population, which is equal to the rate that native born Americans are using public benefits. And then other statistics will tell you that they use it at 50%, which is much higher than native born Americans. So who's right, who's lying? They're both telling the truth. They're just presenting sort of different information. The studies that show immigrants use public benefits at the same rate as native born Americans are only looking at the benefits actually received by the immigrant him or herself. Whereas the studies that say they use it at 50%, they're looking at immigrant households, which includes the US citizen children and spouse of that immigrant. Quite often, if there's an immigrant in the household who's not eligible for the benefit, either because it's a new permanent resident or it's an unlawfully present immigrant, other members of the household can still get public benefits. It's just that the immigrant doesn't. But then there's a question of, well, does he? Does he maybe get those benefits indirectly through the household members? For example, if the children and the US citizen spouse qualify for Section 8 housing, the unlawfully present immigrant may be residing in that housing. So aren't they getting that public benefit even if their name isn't on the public benefit award? Similarly, with things like Medicaid or food stamps, if the kids are getting Medicaid, then the parents don't have to pay for the child's health insurance. As a parent, I have to pay for my kid's health insurance. If I didn't have to pay for that, that would be money I could spend on something else because the household has the income. My kids wouldn't be buying their own health insurance. It all comes from the same pot, my pot as the parent. So when the household members receive the benefit, the household receives the benefit, including any immigrant who's not directly eligible for that benefit. So some may say, well, the immigrant's not getting the benefit. Yeah, they are. Yeah, they are. If the household is getting the benefit, the immigrant's getting the benefit too as a member of the household, even if the immigrant's name isn't on the benefit award. So do immigrants get benefits at a 50% rate or at a 30% rate? They get it at a 50% rate, which is much higher than the native population. Even Vox admits that this is true. In an article published in August of 2017, quoting Stephen Miller, it says, it has cost taxpayers enormously because roughly half of immigrant head of households in the United States receive some type of welfare benefit. This statement, while technically accurate, is based on misleading research. A 2015 rep report by the Center for Immigration Studies, which advocates for limited immigration, concluded that 50% of immigrant-led households use at least one public benefit compared to 30% of American-led households. Once again, they say it's technically accurate. They agree that it's true. But then they go on to say that the Cato Institute has broken down these numbers and that they paint a different picture. So let's look at the report from the Cato Institute. And this was published in May of 2016. They're actually quoting the CIS study. In the no control scenario, immigrant households cost $1,803 more than native households, which is consistent with table two above. The second row shows that immigrant native difference becomes larger up to $2,323 when we control for the presence of a worker in the household. The difference then becomes gradually smaller as controls are added for education and number of children. In the rest of this article from the Cato Institute, they really focus on the fact that when you control for education and the number of children and some other less important factors, that the difference in public benefits use comes down. I don't think anybody's contesting that. I think that the people who are saying immigrants are using welfare at too high of a rate understand that it's because of education level on household size. This doesn't really refute those arguments, so I'm not sure why they thought that that would be convincing. We know that those are the reasons. Let's talk about fraudulent use of public benefits by immigrants. I looked around, I've done a lot of research, there's really not a lot of information out there on fraud rates for public benefits by immigrants. I found one article by the Niskanen Center, which I'd never heard of before, but they really focused on prosecution rates of immigrants for fraudulent public benefit use. They explain why they use prosecution rates. Using prosecutions is a striking tool in measuring the credibility of fraud claims because the prosecutorial numbers are not influenced by politics. Furthermore, there is no dependable evidence that contradicts prosecutorial figures. I would argue that 
prosecution rates are affected by politics, but I do agree with that second sentence. There doesn't seem to be any dependable evidence that contradicts the prosecutorial figures. I've looked around, I just can't find anything. This is really the only information that's out there other than what I'm gonna say in a few minutes. So let's look at what the prosecution rates actually are. As of August 2018, there have been 35 prosecutions that lead with this charge. It's important to put this number in perspective. Give or take, there are roughly 43 million immigrants, legal and illegal, residing in the United States, which accounts which account for 13.5% of the population. Of those 43 million, there were 35 prosecutions for fraud, meaning there was one case of fraud for every 1.228 million immigrants. Okay, that number's a joke. That is not the fraud rate. That might be the prosecution rate, but one of the things that tells me, just based on my own experience, is that those numbers are not gonna be reliable. Which is frustrating because as we just established, they say in the article, and I agree with them, there's no other numbers out there. So it's really, really hard to determine exactly what the fraud rate is because I know that's wrong. How do I know that's wrong? Based on my own clients, I discover public benefit fraud with my clients all the time. There's a couple of ways that I discover my clients have been committing public benefit fraud. One of them is when the client tells me that they've been receiving public benefits and then I glance over at the tax returns and I'm like, how is that possible? You're making way too much money. The most common way that I see people committing this public benefit fraud is there's two spouses and one of them is a US citizen and the other is unlawfully present. So when the US citizen goes to apply for public benefits, either just for herself or for herself and the kids, she doesn't include her husband's income at all. They will file separate tax returns. Quite often she'll file as head of household, which is illegal and that's tax fraud because when you apply for head, as head of household, you are saying, I do not reside with my spouse. If you reside together, you cannot file as head of household. And there's two reasons why they'll often file as head of household. One of them is so that they can claim the earned income tax credit because if you're residing with an unlawfully present spouse who doesn't have a social security number, neither of them, the entire household, cannot get the earned income tax credit. If you file as head of household and you're saying, I don't reside with my spouse, then that US citizen can get it, except that's tax fraud because you actually reside with your spouse. The other reason they'll file as head of household is so that they can get those public benefits. They go to the welfare agency, apply for Medicaid, food stamps, Section 8 housing, you know, what have you, and they only give that head of household tax return that doesn't include the spouse's income. And again, when you file as head of household, you are saying to the IRS, I do not reside with my spouse. He is not a part of my household. So when they apply for the public benefits, they are saying, I do not reside with my spouse. So that is not only tax fraud, it's also public benefits fraud. I see it all the time. I don't, as a matter of course, ask my clients if they're getting public benefits. And the reason I don't ask them is because I do waivers of inadmissibility, which maybe I'll explain some other time, but I have to present a whole case, the whole picture of what's going on with the family. Quite often I'll have to present a financial argument. And I have learned that you're less likely to get approved if you reveal that the household has been getting public benefits. So I try to avoid that. And if I can't use it, if it's not gonna benefit the case, I don't see any reason to ask the client about it. It's not gonna help, so why bother getting into that? I don't even need to know. Quite often, I'll stumble across that information. For example, when the client says, can we use this? We've been getting Medicaid, can we use this? And then I sort of go, oh God, you know, you make too much money. I see the fraud here, no, we can't use it. So they will sort of volunteer that information and I find out that way. And then another way is sometimes when I'm looking at all the financial information and I've got their household budget and I've got their bills, I see how much money they're spending. And then I look at the tax returns and I say, no way is that your income. I think you're underreporting your income. You need to go back and revise your tax returns so that your spending makes sense. And then we have a conversation where they say, yeah, you're right. But then several times the client has said, oh, but if I report my real income, then my spouse will lose her Medicaid. 
I've had that conversation several times. I see it in at least 5% of my cases. And once again, I'm not affirmatively asking about public benefits in, any, in every case. These are the ones where I sort of stumbled across it while conducting the representation. So I imagine that the number is actually higher for how many people are actually getting public benefits. I'm gonna go with at least 10% are getting public benefits and committing some sort of fraud to get them. And the fraud is usually failure to report the income of the unlawfully present immigrant when the rest of the family goes to apply for the public benefits. So these prosecution rates here, one case of fraud in every 1.228 million immigrants, that's a joke. That's ridiculous. It is five to 10% at least, and that's a rough estimate. And I may be off, but I'm not off by this much. And also I have spoken to other attorneys about this issue. I can't reveal to you things that other attorneys have told me in confidence, in private, but they're giving me similar information. That's all for today.